So I'm Brian. I am the uh, curator of fishes at Oregon State University, the uh, curator of the Oregon State Ecology Collection, and this is a talk on challenges and solutions that I've had in digitizing and essentially rejuvenating the collection. How many folks that work with fishes knew that Oregon had, had a collection? That's actually pretty good. Some folks? Anyone not know that? Well, that's good. You've been talking about That's fantastic. It's been off the map for a little while. But um, there's actually a very long history of ichthyology at OSU. The Oregon State Ichthyology Collection started around 1931. The first specimen was apparently a skeletal trout used to teach students about how trout to put together. I can't find it anymore. Um, it was started back in 30 by William Dimmick, and it really grew to a fairly large size under the auspices of Carl Bond in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. He eventually retired, was replaced by Doug Markle, who sort of retired in 2008. He's still around all the time, I see him every day. But they hired me in 2009 to take over the curation of this collection, which is actually a very nice collection, but had a number of issues at that point. This is what it looked like in 2009 when I got there. It's actually a reasonably large collection. It's almost 2,000 catalog lots with probably another 10,000 of backlog. Um, it actually has about 10,000 tissues, but that's a little bit of a, um, I'm obscuring a little bit there, about 9,500 of those are cut through a trout, so if you like cut through a trout, I'm the place where I talk about it. <laughs> and it's about 500 other things that are more interesting that I've added to some other places. Uh, but it's actually got very extensive freshwater and marine collections from all around the Pacific Northwest and additional material from elsewhere. Um, and that doesn't look too bad, you know, there's jars with reasonable waves and hide up on the shelves, but there's some issues. Um, this is where the catalog lots of Oregon are. And I can tell you that, I'll show you why a little bit, because there was at least a little bit of georeferencing and digitization done in the collection, but just from Oregon. Um, the oldest specimens in the collection date to about 1905. They're from Belgium, I don't know why we have them. But <laughs> specimens from Oregon started about 1930. Um, but there are actually notable world holdings from all kinds of places like this. And I figured this out by simply walking around the shelves and seeing where I could find fish for that bridge in Oregon because there was essentially no digital catalog for any of these things when I got there. But there's cool things. There's fish from Iran, there's fish from India, there's fish from Thailand, there's fish from Japan, there's fish from Lake Hall from different places in South America and all sorts of Pacific Islands, things that people might want to know. Um, so currently working on digitizing and georeferencing those. There were also all kinds of curatorial and challenges when I got there. This is delightful. Mm. Anybody know that fruit flies will eat specimens? <laughs> yeah, that, I figured that out when I got there. Why are all these things watching plays in my coffee cup? So, no. so that's about that bad yes. Garbage cans full of desiccating specimens. That's a fruit fly infestation. I think a rockfish found the bottom. So major issues. And also pretty big curatorial challenges in the informatics of this collection. When I got there in 2009, half of the collect catalog was completely undigitized. Card catalogs like this, I can't find the tool notes for a lot of it in the boy. The other half was in a flat Excel file, which was almost worse than not having it at all. Um, <laughs> things like seven different remarks columns, with all sorts of things sorted, no standardization of any of the entries, I mean, major, major things. And then, of course, the biggest territorial challenge was the fire safety issue. This is from the recent V10 tragedy in, um, in Brazil. Fire in alcohol collection actually isn't a joke, it is a serious issue. And boy, did it become an issue um, when I arrived, because less than a month after I got to this position, the fire marshal came and talked with me, because the building was entering renovation, and the fire marshal from Oregon, or from Corvallis, said, you need to bring this collection up to modern fire codes within a couple of years, or you need to get rid of the entire thing. This is a fine thing to have happened to you in your first month on the tenure track. Absolutely delightful. <laughs> Um, so we decided we were going to try to solve this, and I actually got plenty of support from my department and plenty of support from the university, which is a nice part of the story. I said, you know, you just hired me to be the ichthyologist who take away my collection, I'm going to have a very hard time to contend her. Um, and they did, and they actually listened to me. We also talked about the value of the collection and all that sort of thing. So we came up with a plan that involved taking the collection, which used to be in the middle of the building. This is the basement of Nash Hall in Corvallis. Does this work? <coughs> The collection used to be in the dead center of the building, in that area, and we designed a plan to move it to the outside of the building here, which the fire marshals like much better because they can blow off the wall and get access to it. Turn the old collection into new teaching labs, and uh, they to build a very nice facility over here on the side. And we put together a uh, proposal to the NSF. Sometimes desperation pays. I included funds not only to do the, the uh, renovation, we had a bunch of math from the university to help with this. Also to get compact shelving, I said if there are funds not available to do this, we'll need to be accession to destroy a portion of the collection, never any more ideal time to complete the buffering and so on and so forth. 
And in the end, end of that, we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute, I, I promise. Um, but we actually ended up running to love the fire marshal because with, with $400,000 from NSF BRC and more than that matching from Oregon State, we were able to build a beautiful new facility for the collection, which has plenty of compliance to fire code, 30% expansion space, the very attractive compact shelter units that spent a lot of time taking the color of the side. <laughs> <laughs> the garden that's orange and black, just like the Oregon State colors, it's important to do these things. Um, but it's a, much, it's a lovely collection now. So this is what it now looks like on the inside. We moved it. Major curatorial advances, you can see the space to expand the collection, put new things on the shelves. We've got this very interesting tank farm. Uh, fire marshal decided they wanted to handle this. And getting the, the, the steel tank from the top tier is kind of interesting, but it does work. Uh, this is a major, a major improvement to fire safety, earthquake safety. There's a swimming pool over this, so every jar and tank in the collection breaks, it will all flow into this reservoir and it explode down there. I don't know. <laughs> they like that. And we've also got a, um, a new prep room that looks like this, and I was able to migrate everything into Specific 6, so these are everything that I had, and we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. There's also a thermal label printer and also the things, that, the tools you need to actually curate a modern collection. So that's good. We saved the collection, that was like the first two years of my life that was already saved. Now, you might want to ask me, well, what do I have? What's in these shelves? Why do we save this collection? So we need to digitize the collection database. Some of this is now done. My first task was actually cleaning and migrating that Excel spreadsheet into Specify. I assure you, we can clean in unit one. Um, but it's something that I could actually accomplish myself. I spent about a summer, off and on, not the entire summer, standardizing those forms, combining seven remarks fields, figuring out who all the collectors are, and there is a JLS, the same thing as this average or whatever it was. And um, you're really, really beginning to standardize an ontology, what's the geography tree, what's the taxon tree going to be what is the namespace for my collection so that I can begin to figure out what I have. Now, over the first summer that I had to work on this, I really did that myself. One person spending a lot of time looking at all the data and trying to, to get that into basically an ontology. That wasn't that bad, that's doable, that solved the issue for most of the Oregon fish which had been entered into this, this database, or Excel spreadsheet earlier. Get that into specify, not too bad. This is a whole other world of work. So this is what you're looking at, the front side of one of about 10,000, one of the 20,000 cars, um, one of about 10,000 that hadn't been entered into the database. Uh, so there's all kinds of handwritten things, and there is fields that say things like a uh, year, or collector, or terminator, or locality, or substrate, or that sort of thing. But there's no, no, um, no control over what actually put on these cars in the first place. Sometimes there's dual numbers, usually there's not. Sometimes there's dates, sometimes the dates are in unstated files. Sometimes it's just people's initials, it's just people's last names. Um, the taxonomy is quite interesting as you go back to things in the 40s and 50s. So is the geo of the phylogenetic organization of the collection. It's a different story. Anybody remember Isis Fondly? Apodes? Possible. Awesome. Imagine all, all of those things. But I've got this large stack of uh, cards, this backside of them as well. So the backside looks like lots of remark fields. And so I needed to figure out how I'm going to take this information and get it into a database that people can, can use it, and I can answer questions like, how many specimens do you have on the North Pacific? I have no idea. What other countries are represented in your database? I have no idea. I've been walking around <laughs> the collection and seeing what's on the jars. But I can't do it all myself. Curation is only about 20% of my involvement. I have to teach classes. I can do research. I can do different things. I have graduate students and all those things. Um, and so the only way to really solve this problem was to get students involved. And luckily I have many, many fantastic students that love fish and fisheries at Oregon State, and I have a veritable flock of them that I need to hurt around and try to get past the done in the collection. I have a collection manager. I do now have a private student associated with this grant for a little while to help me out. What I basically have is me and a herd of willing undergraduates. So I need to figure out how to make that work. The collection depends on undergraduate and to some degree graduate students to function. We have them involved in cataloging, we have them involved in specimen prep, we have them involved in outreach. That's something talking to some students uh, in the grade. But just a couple of our people, lots of people involved with the collection, and I couldn't even quite get them all to, to send me photos of themselves. So there's 12 or 13 people, students actively involved, as well as a couple of professors and artists, and so on and so forth. These people are wonderful. But there's lots of challenges in dealing with either students or in some cases volunteers, maybe an analogous situation we have. They do the darndest things. <laughs> These are all green. Oh, the jars need to put them back on the same slot of the shelves after I filled them? Oh, we didn't mention that. You 
you wanted to keep these cards after I did it? Left the bee bottles out to recycle them. It's all right, of course, but recycle them. So I found these cards in my backpack from six months ago. Is that you might have those back? And why were they in the backpack in the first place? <laughs> I needed to keep track of which ones I, I finished. You don't, you don't just know that? Or I needed to know which tank I put the shark back in. <laughs> so I mean, and these are not necessarily the students' faults. They don't understand, they're not thinking. You know, I didn't specifically say that you needed to put the jar back in the same spot. I said it's very important that you know what spot it came off the shelf. It's not quite the same thing as you in the same spot. So you can't be too explicit. And you'll know that I'm taking a slightly different approach to this talk and going through every step of my workflow. I've posted the whole workflow that I'm going to be talking about on there. You can download it and look at it on your screen right now. It's linked from, from the wiki. So we now actually have a fairly explicit work, uh, workflow about how I want students to take cards and enter the data from them. Step one, search specify to see if the record has already been entered. It seems very, very, very trivial, but if you don't tell them to do that, they'll go and try to enter all of that and say, well, let me create a duplicate record. What did I do wrong? <laughs> so you have to be incredibly specific. Even if it seems like it is completely obvious, you write that down and you illustrate it. Okay, so if you know, nothing comes out, you're just empty. So the workload is full of things like this, every single step. Here is all the concordance So uh, I have county to go to county. I have locality to go to locality. Do you think that maybe that not make sense? Or I think it would make perfect sense, but it, it doesn't. You have to be incredibly explicit. Arrows are good, circles are good, if this, then that. You have this situation good, this sub appendix. Look at that. And you control vocabularies are absolutely important. You need to restrict the choices available to the students so they will make student choices that are very interesting. Pull down lists are fantastic. We have them for things like year, preservative, prep type, type status, developmental stage, is this an adult, a juvenile, or an egg? Is this card relevant to an alcohol specimen, a clear disdain specimen, you know, who knows what? Putting that so they have to pick it out of a list rather than type it in, it will save you a world of hurt later. Um, there are ontologies such as taxa trees, there's a geography tree, um, specified provides a lot of those, which is very helpful. You'll still need to modify them a little bit for some of your old taxonomy and such. That's in, in the collection. And then be aware that some fields are just going to be problematic. We do horse ones and localities and collecting events because the historical collection didn't use field numbers as identifications for a lot of the collecting events. They have them in some cases, but there's all kinds of localities and collecting events from that Excel spreadsheet that didn't have field numbers. And we've been creating them in the past, and there's a part of the, the uh, an appendix to the worksheet that we're showing you about how we're creating W field numbers. And we're having students do that as well. But that means that they need to search collection, collecting events, and they need to search localities when they're entering new, new, new cards to see whether or not it's been duplicated. And that is the most common error that they're making. They keep entering the same collecting event over and over again, so we have to go clean that up sometimes. They also like to replicate people. I'm not entirely sure why they like to replicate people so much. But they do. So there's a strong tendency to duplicate like these are some things. Initials are really bad for people. Please don't ever record it. It's an initial to make them um, terrible. Um, but you need to go back and you have to help them with that and understand that you're going to need to do some quality control on the data after the student's entry. They're great for getting it in, but it's, it's not a good for the process. And sometimes you need to use nested workflows, in particular when you can't or it's very difficult to generate a complete ontology. Um, in this case, this is drainage. One of the fields that's important in our collection is drainage. And it's particularly important for regions within Oregon because we have a lot of people that are using the collection to look at the distribution of taxonomy and vision in Oregon. So we can be very controlled the division of the state into these different data drainages. This also all these puff codes and such that might have that some of the other professors want in the collection, but drain it. So it's, but we don't have a pick list for drainage because it's the same field that we also want to have a specimen from Thailand or a specimen from Africa, whatever it is. It's the Orange River, or it's the Congo River. Um, I don't have a complete ontology for every drainage in the world, so it's a free text field. And so if you look at the online document, there's also a very large appendix that says what we want students to put in for the drainage. And for the most part, they have now figured out what I want after we've talked to them about it individually in many different times. So that's one thing. Sometimes you just need to deal with it. So 
I'm going to run out of time. Um, you feel free to look at the workflow to see how we're handling things like this. Supervision is really key. It's great to get all these people involved in what you're doing, but don't assume that it's free for you. Your initial training by a new student or a new volunteer is likely to take several hours even for a simple workflow. And then once you start to turn loose on it, um, unless they're the kind of student that's going to make all kinds of mistakes on their own and then ask you to fix it, you can expect upwards of 20 questions an hour when a student is just started. They're going to ask you about almost every field that they're putting in just to make sure they have it right. It's one of the careful ones. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you need to set aside your time to be available to them initially to, to, to handle that. And you also need to be very, very sure that your database reports can enter the modified each entry because you can then go back to it and look for patterns in your errors and then talk to people about specific things that they might want to change. But all of that said, the success is absolutely possible. This is a student who knows they're using a printed out, printed out version of my workflow, so they're clearly doing it right, they've got the cards in front of them. Um, a trained undergraduate can digitize six or seven of these cards in an hour with actually a reasonable reliability. Once they figure it out, they're, they're pretty good. They are thrilled to work for 10 bucks an hour. The work study students are even cheaper, and sometimes they will even volunteer for you. That is way cheaper than my time. Way cheaper. I'm not going to pay that much, but I assure you we're going to work for 10 bucks an hour. We have about 5,000 of these cards remaining, about 5,000 of them are done. That's about 800 hours, or about $8,000 plus significant time. It's actually a reasonably affordable way to go and get this done. It won't be absolutely perfect, but it will get the data out there in a form that I can at least begin to grapple with it and see what else needs to be done. It also directly benefits the students. They are thrilled to have this line on their CVs to say that they were a collections assistant for Brian Sidlaskis and the Oregon State Archaeology Collection. And some of them are going on to do other things like land internships at the Smithsonian for having done this. So that's good stuff. So it helps everyone, but you have to be really careful about how you do it. And that illustrates your workflows. So next up, we're going to be imaging and geo-representing the collection as well. But you'll note that I put this in a completely different workflow. I want to get this stage done before I go back and begin to actually image lots and geo there's a different approach that people seem to be doing the whole thing at once. That's not the approach I take because I was so interested in beginning to get the database in some sort of baseline state where I can actually begin to get a handle. <coughs> That's what's going on, and thank you very much.